Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, at first glance, our gospel reading is a very well-known story of Jesus resisting temptation from the devil as he's out in the wilderness or in the desert. It's a lot to teach us about our Savior and how we as Christians can seek to avoid temptation and steer clear of evil. These lessons are good and important, but for us as readers, it's critical for us today to read our gospel story with the rest of Scripture in tow. For when we do, we see that today's story is not just another story of Jesus to learn from, but rather we see it for what it truly is. And that, strangely enough, is a sequel. Jesus is not driven to the desert simply for us to learn about temptation. He's driven to the desert to complete a story begun well before his birth. Jesus takes up a narrative nearly 1,500 years prior to his birth. And through this, we see some marvelous things about who our Savior is. That 1,500-year journey back into the past takes us to the people of Israel in the wilderness of their own. They've been eyewitnesses to the power and might of God in the previous days and weeks. From great plagues descending upon the land of Egypt, such as blood and locusts and darkness and the events of the Passover, to the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground, the people have witnessed event after event that only God could do. And the things that they have seen are so otherworldly that only the divine could be responsible for it. God has delivered them from their slavery. He's rescued them from Egypt. He's performed impossible tasks that only he could do. And now he's safely guiding them through this wilderness they find themselves in. Now God turns the people into the depths of the wilderness. He goes before them in a pillar of cloud and fire, leading them. And the places they walk are very similar to the outside the city limits of Las Vegas. If you've driven in any direction, you go through the desert. It's a desolate place. There's little food, little water. But the people of God have seen amazing things that only God himself could do. Yet it's here, in this wilderness, that they're met with temptation. The first place the temptation arrives is their stomachs. They have seen God do miraculous things, yet the tempter comes and fills them with doubt. That the same God who opened the Red Sea would now let them starve to death in this wilderness. It gets so bad that they long for the days of their slavery where at least they had some food to eat. And their hearts are turned so that Egypt seems to be the place to be. So in response, God once again does the amazing. He brings quail and manna for the people to eat. Yet in the midst of this amazing act of God, the tempter comes a second time. You see, God had told Moses and Moses the people this explicit direction for how they were to gather the food that God was providing for them. But the time, this time, the tempter comes to lead the Israelites to doubt God's instruction, twisting his words. God commands that the excess of food not be kept overnight, and yet the people did, wondering if God would be true to his word or would continue to provide for them as he has done. God also commands them not to gather on the Sabbath, yet many went out looking for food on that day. The tempter brought confusion to God's word and led the people away as the people fell into sin. Their trust in God eroded away. And finally, the tempter comes again as the people are gathered around Mount Sinai. They have seen Moses go up the mountain, but they haven't seen him return yet. And despite seeing the miracles of Egypt, despite being fed when they were hungry, they think themselves abandoned, and they turn to Aaron to craft a god for them. A golden calf is raised, and the people fall down and worship this new god of their own creation. The tempter used their fears, he twisted God's word, and he brought them from the faith of a god that was so clearly with them and for them to this great evil they commit. You see, the people in the wilderness, when they're faced with temptation, they fall to it. 
Their time in the wilderness is marked with erosion of trust in the God who has done so much for them, even as they've been eyewitnesses to the things he can and did do for them. All those years later, another son of Abraham comes forth. Through the river Jordan, God makes himself known once again. This time it's not plagues or parting of seas, but rather it's his son as he comes up out of his baptism. The heavens open and something like a dove descends on Jesus, the Holy Spirit's coming to aid in his work as the Messiah. And as these heavens open and this dove descends, a voice booms, you are my beloved son and with you I am well pleased. God in Trinity has made himself known in this moment. The people have seen something otherworldly happen, something divine in nature. And there was no doubt of God's presence and of his guidance as the Spirit now drives Jesus into the wilderness, leaving civilization behind. And as the son of Abraham is driven into the wilderness, the same tempter, the devil himself, is present in this desolate and harsh place. For 40 days, Jesus fasts in the wilderness, and he's hungry and weary at the end of it. Now comes the tempter, prowling like a lion, seeking prey to destroy as he had done with Jesus' ancestors. As with the people of Israel, the devil begins by using Jesus' hunger against him. If you are the Son of God, the devil whispers, command this stone to become bread. That Jesus comes with no desire to return to Egypt and its food. Jesus has no desire to play these games with Satan, and he'll use his power for himself. Instead, he uses it for those who need it, for those outside of himself. And he responds simply to Satan's request, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And Jesus' ministry will be marked by the use of his power not for the self, but rather self-sacrifice for the other. He defeats the temptation of the devil. Now the enemy recoils and takes a different approach. The tempter takes Jesus to the top of a tall mountain, and in an instant he shows Jesus all of the nations in the world, with all of their glory and splendor. All of this could belong to Jesus if Jesus would just bow down and worship the devil. There is no golden calf for this son of Abraham. As Jesus responds, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. His faithfulness is tested and true as once again the devil fails to tempt Jesus. Jesus' kingdom will not take for itself the world on its own terms, but rather through the spread of the kingdom of God. Finally, after hearing scripture in response to his temptation, Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Satan twists God's word once again and tempts Jesus into a very public display of his divinity that angel armies would come to his service and show all who he truly is, a display of power and might and authority. And Jesus' response is simply, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. With his failure, the evil one slinks back into the shadows as he is defeated by Christ once again, and he waits for a more opportune time. Jesus does what the people of Israel could not do themselves. Jesus perfectly resists the temptations of the evil one. Temptations designed to lead Jesus into unfaithfulness with his charge as Messiah. Temptations that would have left the rest of the world stranded in sin if committed. Jesus stands victorious over Satan, where the people of Israel fell short. So for us today... The story is so much more than a help with our own temptation. As we hear the fullness of what Jesus has done, who in the story do we most resonate with? Do you and I resonate with the one who resists temptation perfectly? Or do we see ourselves as the one who falls short continually in our charge of faithfulness? 
Well, as together we confess this morning, and as we do each and every week, we've fallen into our temptations. Together as a people, we've let our sinful flesh, the world, and even the enemy himself tempt us, and we've all fallen into sin. Temptations on their own are not sinful, but rather, like the people of Israel, when we step through them, we find ourselves mired in sin. Satan's goal and temptation is the same as it was with the people of Israel and the same as it was with Jesus. He seeks to destroy what God is building. He comes bearing temptations that would lead you and I astray. Satan seeks to use our fears and insecurities to doubt God. Like Israel, fearing they had enough food, they turned on their God. Satan uses our desires for companionship as we seek it in sinful ways. He uses our desires for the things of this world that we might try and get them in evil ways. He uses our desire for power and authority and helps us to rule and lord over others in sinful ways. Satan then seeks to twist God's word, making it about us and not about him where we begin to truly justify our sinful actions. Did God really say that this is sinful? God cannot be against this. This is a good thing. He leads to confusion as he twists and turns us using God's own word. Then Satan seeks for us to abandon our faith, for us to move from God's house into his Think for a moment yourself about your battles with temptation and how Satan is using those temptations to lead you and guide you astray from the faith that God has so wonderfully given to us. Temptation is a danger for us. Like Israel, we stumble and we fall. Our sinful ways time and time again return to us. The same temptations come knocking again and again and again. All of us experience it. All of us fall short. All of us walk through that temptation into sin. Satan truly desires destruction. But then we see our second part of our story. We see Jesus himself. The evil seeks his destruction. And they think they get it. As Jesus is put on a mock trial, he's beaten There's horrific rage thrown against him as the people clamor for his death. Then he's nailed to a cross and died. Satan looks at that and thinks he stands victorious. Yet when Satan thinks he has the victory, Jesus bursts forth from the tomb. And in his death, he has defeated sin, death, and the devil for you and for me. He has borne all of our sins, all of the temptations that we've fallen into, Go with him into the grave, and he rises again into newness of life. Yet as we look at Christ, we don't simply see a model for how to resist temptation, but instead we see our champion against Satan, because Christ's righteousness has become our perfect righteousness. When we stumble and fall in our temptations, we remember that Christ our Lord is victorious, Where we fall into temptation and sin, we remember Jesus' faithfulness. Because Jesus' faithfulness becomes ours in our baptism. As we are baptized into Christ, we put on that perfect nature that is Jesus. It's given to us. It's gifted. As our sins are washed away, when the Father looks at us, he doesn't see our temptations, our failures, our guilt and our shame. Instead, he sees the perfect faithfulness of Christ. Therefore, when we are baptized into Christ, that sin is forgiven. Those failures when facing our temptations, it's forgiven. We can stand assured that God loves us, that we are in his house, and that he cares for us. But now as Christians, we don't expect the attacks from the evil one to stop, but rather to get worse. Satan wants to destroy our very faith that we cling to. The very thing that gives us proper standing before God because of God's grace for you and for me. Therefore, in our temptations, when Satan comes seeking to destroy, we look to God. And we cling to him for our hope. 
And as Jesus in the wilderness pointed out, he highlights the importance of Scripture for you and for me, as it's a guidance for our life in the faith. It helps us to see our Savior clearly, and helps us to see what God commands and what he does not command. It also highlights the importance of our time together as a church, because it's here in this place that together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we build our lives around who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Each and every week, Jesus is proclaimed. Your sins are forgiven. The work of the devil is foiled once again. As we gather in this place, we receive the goodness from Christ our Lord. And Satan is defeated. And in a few moments together, we'll be praying the Lord's Prayer together. Where we ask God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When we face temptation, Christ is our champion. He is the one who goes forth and does battle with Satan for you and for me. And when the evil one, when the world or even our own sinful flesh urges us in temptation to sin, flee to Christ. Because Christ is the one who defeats Satan, who destroys darkness. He's the one who delivers his people. So as Christians in this place, as we wrestle with our temptations, as we wrestle with our sins... We look forward to the day when Christ our Lord comes again in the clouds. When Satan and all of his minions and all that would tempt you and I to sin will be destroyed. And we can live in blessedness and goodness forever with Jesus in heaven. And we look forward to that great and glorious day and that new creation where we join together in wonderful song with our Savior. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.